Let's state uh, one specific model on, on which I'm going to talk, and this is weekly self-avoiding walk. Lace expansion started with this model, and it's still the easiest by far to analyze, much less technical than the others. And the model is as follows. For any path, suppose gamma is some path, say in, a, in some graph, which usually people take to be ZD, but we will not take necessarily to be ZD. So you def and suppose beta is some parameter. So we denote the weight of gamma with respect to beta, but I will not put it in notation, as E, no, sorry, as 1 minus beta to the power of the number of couples, ST, number of self-intersections of gamma. Okay, so I count how many self-intersections gamma has, and penalize a, a gamma exponentially with this weight. So if beta is equal to zero, then, then all the weights are the same, and this is just, uh, the process will, once you wait according to these weights, you will just get simple random walk. If beta is equal to one, then you just get the usual self-avoiding walk because the penalizing mean, means that you kill all paths which intersect, which intersect themselves, and you are only left with simple paths. Okay, so this is if somebody is more familiar with self-avoiding walk than with weekly, then self-avoiding walk is simply the case beta equals to one. Okay, and we want to, and the, the classical uh, result, which started this field, which is due to Bridges and Spencer, on the graph ZD, D uh, five or more. Uh, there exists some beta zero such that if beta is smaller than beta zero, then, okay, let me write, write it not so precisely, then, uh, uh, then, uh, then the process is in fact uh, uh, behaves similar to simple random walk. So if you look at, uh, for example, you take all paths of length n, uh, you f and uh, you wait according to this weight, and you look at, for example, the end the point, and it goes to this distance approximately square root n. This is a, this is a classical, this is the first paper where less expansion was used. Less expansion is a technique that was used to prove this. So what we wanted to do was to general, and since then it was, uh, uh, the technique was used for many other models, percolation, uh, lattice trees, lattice animals, easing, etc. And, you know, more precise results were achieved. But everything was restricted to ZD. And we wanted to examine what happens on graphs when your graph is not necessarily a, a, a lattice in space. So for, let's take the, the simplest example, which is the Heisenberg group. Okay, now the Heisenberg group will not work, but, 
but it's you know keep good to keep in mind. So what's the Heisenberg group? The Heisenberg group is just the group where you put of matrices. You put uh, integer uh, entries above the diagonal, one on the diagonal, and zero below the diagonal. This gives you a group. It's very easy to see that the uh, products and inverses are still of this form. And uh, uh, you pick uh, you pick generators. So this group is also finitely generated. So, so you can find, for example, the following two matrices. You actually don't need <laughs> to <laughs> take a, don't need three generators. It's enough to have two. <laughs> the following two matrices. Sorry for not writing the ones on the diagonal. There is no point in me writing them every time. But the following two matrices, if you, by taking products and inverses, you can get any matrix of this form. If you don't know this fact, then you can prove it yourself. It's not difficult. The, the, in two steps, you will get something in the corner. Don't worry. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, and now, so let's call this set S. So S is, you know, I'm not very particular about my generators, but let's, for concreteness sake, take uh, Take this set, and now our, what will be our graph? So vertices will just be the elements of the group. Edges. That's the usual construction of Cayley graph, if you're familiar with that. Edges are just all couples. G, G, S, where G is in our group, and S in our generating set. Okay, so this is a standard construction of a right Cayley graph. The graph ZD are of this form, but we are interested in things which are beyond ZD. And now we would like to know on this graph, does self avoiding work behave like random work? Now, there is absolutely no reason for it to happen. It's probably not true because this doesn't have a <laughs> sufficiently high dimension, but, uh, but it does. But but it will work if you take like four by four matrices. Okay, so let me state a, a theorem. Let G be nilpotent. Again, if you don't like generalities, just think about four by four Heisenberg group. So. Four by four matrices with up uh, above diagonal. Uh, S finite set of generators. Okay, uh, finitely generated. So a discrete, if you want. S a, fin a set of finite set of generators. And now there is a theorem of uh, Gromov that says that in this case, the no, not of Gromov, much earlier. So there is a classical theorem that says that in this case, if you take the ball in our graph, okay, should I define this notation, the ball in the graph? These are just all points that you can get from some fixed element. Uh, well, it doesn't matter which element because the graph is transitive, but uh, just for concreteness, let's take just the identity matrix. <laughs> okay? The ball of radius, so you take the number, uh, so it's all the elements, or all the matrices if you want, all the elements of the group that you can get by no more than R generators. Uh, group guys would call it the wall distance, but we can just call it the graph distance. And I ask how many elements are in the ball. It's known that in impotent groups, this is up to constant r to some power, which is uh, an integer number. And assume this number is bigger than 4, which is the only assumption. 
that doesn't hold for this group. I would like to give all my talk about the Heisenberg group, but unfortunately, Heisenberg group, Heisenberg group has exactly four-dimensional growth, so it doesn't satisfy. So uh, for proper propriety, I should take a four-by-four four matrices. Uh, then there exists some beta zero, such that for any beta smaller than beta zero, Ah, okay. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> the critical green function, <laughs> okay, I will define everything. I will define everything. Don't, don't panic. Of the weakly self-avoiding walk is smaller than twice the green function of the usual random walk. So what's the, sorry, I should have said that before. I'm a bit, uh, it's a bit early for me. So the green function at lambda is just sum from n. Uh, okay, it just let me put it like this. It's just sum over all paths from zero to x. I cannot uh, I cannot stop calling an arbitrary point of of the lattice zero. You will have to excuse me for that. Of lambda to the power of the length of, of the path times its weight. Okay, so that's the green function uh, of, of weakly self-avoiding walk. Let me put the w here also so that make it quite sure that we understand that we're talking about the weak case. Okay, so uh, the green function is a function of beta, the weakness parameter, lambda, the, okay, the, 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 the killing parameter, it will be the analog of killing if you're talking about killed random walk, and of course of the point. Okay, so, so I will measure being close to random walk by looking at the critical green function. So there is a radius of convergence and we call it lambda c. And here there is something that I'm, uh, that you will have to, to take my word on, that looking at the critical uh, green function is the right thing to do. And this I will not explain. I, I apologize. This will take us to a completely different uh, branch of, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the problem, and, I, I, uh, and uh, it will just be you know, a, a diversion. And, uh, so, and this is the usual green function. So this is just the expected number of visits. Expectation of... Uh, so the green function, okay, the, green fu the usual green function at x is the expectation of number of visits of random walk at x. Let me skip the notation of calling an arbitrary point zero. Okay, so... What I'm not going to explain is why this is an interesting claim. This you'll have to take me uh, as a fact that once you know you have an estimate for the critical green function, then you can extract a lot of proper a lot of claims just from that without you know formally from that. Okay, just let me finish the sentence. So. Uh, you can just extract formally from that without knowing too much about the, the process that a lot of claims like this is like random walk. Yes? Yes, that would only require that d bigger than 2. Yes, yes. From that, from that, point, from that point of view, Cayley graphs 
are like uh, ZD. So you have the, exactly the same asymptotic, it's really the same heat kernel asymptotics and the same grain function asymptotics. This is, uh, in fact, most of the proofs of the, you know, standard, uh, not the Fourier proofs, but most of the standard operator proofs actually started from <laughs> in this setting. So, uh. okay, is the statement of the theorem clear? Lambda C is not 1 over 2D. <laughs> no, it's not 1 over 2D. Like, uh, yeah, I didn't divide by 1. So you would, so if there was no interaction, it would be 1 over 2D, but it's not. It's, it's a strictly smaller, uh, strictly larger. One over two D? Oh, of course, because look, I, I'm just, right, I, di I didn't divide here by one. <laughs> if you want one, I have to put here one over two D instead of beta, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, if there was no interaction, lambda c would be 1 over 2d, but because of the interaction, in fact, it's a bit large. Okay, and, and uh, is the statement clear? No. No. That's part of the fun in, in all in this. About the weekly self avoiding work, yes. For example, the, the end point is uh, square root in distance square root n from uh, the starting point. If you fix n. Yeah, yeah, you can get from that all Gaussians, but it's uh, you get the bubble condition and then the analysis. Uh, I don't want to go into this, this area, but yes, it gives you, you know, basically anything. Uh, like in percolation, then you have triangle condition, then you can construct from that everything just formally without knowing, you know, without repeating the complicated argument that gets to the triangle condition. The same thing holds for the self-avoiding work. You have this, you even need much less. It's enough that this sum square is finite <laughs> and, uh, and that's it. Okay, so I, I guess I have to justify actually doing that, you know, why is that interesting? So is it, you know, wh why do statistical mechanic type uh, processes on groups? It's not a completely, you know, obvious, you know, <laughs> of course, if you have two, th <laughs> one the the theorem that I, I don't want to say, I'm, well, I just generalized it for sake of generalization. I, I, I'm trying to, I'm, but on the other hand, I don't have a really much better <laughs> answer than, than that. It's not, Doing random work on groups is a well-established uh, thing. It uh, g gives very nice results on random works, which are it, it has applications for random works which are not on groups. It has applications for statistical mechanics. It has applications for groups which have nothing to do with random works. It's a completely established field, but statistical mechanics on groups is not so well established. There are these beautiful uh, works on percolation on non-amenable uh, groups, which were done by in the 90s by uh, uh, Oded and Ditai and Yuval and Ras, and it's beautiful, beautiful theory, but it, has, it didn't give us any better understanding of percolation in other settings. So, and I cannot, I cannot really, uh, so so I so that's not a, a really good example. So so I would say to to somehow, but in a way, what we did somewhat vindicates that it is a worthwhile topic because after we proved this theorem, we got uh, some you know fallout, which is would be a simpler proof for ZD. In my opinion, significantly simpler, but that's you know really a matter of taste, and uh, better results for uh, for the long range case. So in the last few years, there was some a lot of work on trying to do lace uh, in trying to do lace expansion for long range models where you have. Uh, let me not define it because I will not dis discuss it, but you, you multiply here by some, you, you, you take some weights on, on, for example, even in one dimension. It's interesting even in one dimension and then uh, 
and then you put some weights that decay in some rate that you fix in advance, and you basically repeat the same uh, model. And then you ask, you know, when can you expect, well, okay, not Gaussian, but the same behavior as random walk, which would be a stable behavior. When can you expect stab stable behavior uh, for, uh, for this? When can you expect that the self-avoiding walk behaves as random walk would be on the same long-range uh, graph? There were some results, but the conditions on the random walk were very difficult to, uh, to uh, were very restrictive. The first version of the paper, <laughs> it made some list of, of, of requ requirements on the random walk, but uh, there was not even a single example of a random walk which actually satisfied these, ex <laughs> these conditions. Later, <laughs> later, the paper was improved, but, but uh, not, not ours. I mean, the first papers on long-range models. So, and our method in allows to, in fact, uh, simplify this and... Uh, so the basically requiring only a local uh, let me write that because it will play a central role in the in the talk so only local central limit theorem so so one of the results is, and I'm not going to state it explicitly, uh, you know, in a formal way, but essentially, if you have a long-range model that satisfies with the sufficiently high, uh, with the correct connection between the dimension and the, and the exponent of escape, and if it satisfies local central limit theorem, then you can do this expansion. And let me not say anything else about that. Let's keep it, you know, vague. Okay. So I guess I'll start with the proof. <laughs> uh, yeah, having, I think, I think maybe I will start in the ZD case, even though there are at least a number of people here who saw already the ZD case. I'm, I'm afraid I'm talking about this a bit too much, but but anyway, the ZD case contains most of the interesting stuff. So let's, let's, and I'm going to do that for ZD. Okay, so again, what am I proving? The same, th the same theorem that's stated here, but for the specific case, just for concreteness, or not just for concreteness, it will be simplified in place, with G being the usual lattice, and uh, in dimension bigger than 4. And then I want to show, the, to analyze the critical, the critical green function. And of course, as usual in this question, the question is, how can you learn anything about the critical value when you don't know its value? <laughs> right? How do, you, how do you even approach it? So let me, uh, so, but, hmm, which order do I want to say that? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so. Now, so, so lace expansion is all about solution of convolution equations, and this is uh, and this is the so so uh, what are we okay? Let's start with the question: How do you approach the critical value? The answer to this is as follows: uh, We will prove something. Okay, let me just state two lemmas. Lemma one. Okay. For any d bigger than four, there exists beta zero. For any beta smaller than beta zero, assume, and for any lambda, Subcritical. So this is the first, the first answer to the question: How do we learn something at the behavior of lambda critical? We show something that uh, uh, that works for any lambda, and then take a limit. Assume 
G lambda is smaller, G lambda beta is smaller than three times the usual Green function. And this is a pointwise estimate. This is for every x. Then there exists a magical function delta. That's a fun delta is a function from Z D into R with the following properties. First of all, its convolution with the is just the The convolu so okay, so wh why did I call it delta? Why is it? It's the analog of the Laplacian for the simple random walk. Okay, if you have the simple random walk, then I hope most people here have seen that. That if you take the just the green function, right? So for the usual random walk, ah, uh, where will I write that? Okay, not the best place, but let it be. So. If you take the usual green function random walk and you convert, convolve it with the usual Laplacian, then you get delta zero. And the usual Laplacian is just the function which is one at zero minus one over two d at uh, all uh, at all the neighbors of zero and zero elsewhere. Okay, so this is the usual Laplacian, and this is the. Uh, if you haven't seen that, the, the work it out. It's, it's very simple, and my my point is to fac manufacture a, fu a function that will satisfy the same for the for the uh, for the self-avoiding walk green function. It's too small, okay. Uh, well, I haven't finished actually, but uh, let me just write it bigger. So, the Laplacian convolution with the green function is equal to uh, uh, the to the indicator at zero. Okay, is, is this, uh, can everyone read it now? Okay, and also, of course, I haven't finished the statement of the lemma, and it's, sat and it's also satisfying the following properties. Uh, which order did they put them in my notes? Delta also depends on lambda. Let me write it here. Where, which one? Oh, R W R W. <laughs> <laughs> then, okay, this is my the assumption of the lemma. Okay, the, the lemma has uh, okay four uh, silly assumptions and then the most important assumption. Okay, and the conclusion is that a function exists which satisfy this equation, and three more conditions which I haven't finished uh, writing. So, so oh, the W, yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> Okay, let me finish just the statement.
Okay, so now, now the statement of dilemma is complete, and now let me again e explain what is going on. Uh, so, I'm saying the green function of the weekly, let me say that in words, the green function of the weekly self avoiding walk has a Laplacian which functions similarly to the random walk Laplacian in the following manners. First of all, this is uh, just, uh, first of all, the convolution is just the indicator at zero. So it's like the inverse in the, appropriate, in the convolution algebra. And also, it has a number of, of, of properties which are, like the, uh, which are like the usual Laplacian. First of all, okay, the symmetry is the least interesting here, and I will drop it very soon. But this is symmetric to coordinate, both to coordinate permutations and also to uh, flipping of signs. Okay? Then you have this property, which is, uh, okay, it actually follows immediately from the convolution concept, but this is the most interesting fact. It's a perturbation of the random walk Laplace. Now, I didn't define this guy, so let me define uh, this guy. So if you put here a lambda, then that would mean that I want to put the lambda here. Uh, the lambda or the minus lambda? I guess the minus lambda. Yes, as written. Okay, so. So the idea is as follows. I would like to say that the green function is a perturbation of the green of the random or green function, but instead of doing it directly, I'm going. To, I'm saying that the Laplacian, which is not a priori even well defined, is a perturbation of the Laplacian. Now you will notice that this that this has there are two pieces here. First of all, it has the decay. It decays. In space, it's not, you know, the usual green, uh, green function Laplacian is just completely localized. This is not the case here. It will decay, but decay for our purposes quite fast. And also, there is a global condition. This beta, which, as you remember, is a sufficiently small guy, it bounds everything, including at zero. Yeah, okay, I meant here, you know. <laughs> Zero to negative power would be one, okay? <laughs> so so this, this bounds everything uh, globally, the, the, this beta here. And this is an absolute constant, doesn't depend on anything. And this just bounds everything globally. Okay, is the statement of the lemma clear? Yes. I cannot because, because of exactly what I said, because this uh, beta, because I want it to be small even at zero, near zero and the uh, uh, behavior. The otherwise, yeah, if, if I didn't care about, you know, if I, if I only care about the tail behavior, then I don't need this. But uh, I want to say that it's small everywhere. That's why I have to put it there. And this is also like, it's also a good way to think about it, but that's, uh, but uh, I needed this for. Okay, the, the global behavior is as important as the tail behavior. Any other questions? I guess the statement is, is, is clear. Okay. Now let me state a, a second lemma and and then explain how. And the second lemma, which is would be most of what I'm going to talk about is a lemma, how can you bound once you have some estimate for delta, how can you bound g back? Okay, and this is lemma two. This, this two is not a mistake.
Okay, so the second lemma is about solving, about inverting convolution equations. Here we don't, th this is, lemma is already not geometric. All the geometry will come in the first lemma. This lemma is about solving convolution equations and it works already at dimension equal to two. Oh, three, okay. Okay, and it says that with these conditions, you can, if you have a, a function which satisfies these three conditions, then you can invert it and the, yes. No, C times beta, sorry. Beta is a, is a small letter and this is a big C because, you know, it's an arbitrary, it's a big constant. So it has to be a capital C. That's, you know, a, a, a lovely convention that constants which are sufficiently large are, are, a, are denoted with a capital C and constants which are sufficiently small are denoted with small C. Well, beta, of course, is a small Greek letter, so it has to be a bit lower. So sorry if it looks like a subscript. <laughs> But it's C times beta, <laughs> yes, <laughs> to, to, to cut a long story short. Okay, so then the solution satisfies an inequality which is better than what we started with. So how can that be? Of course, it doesn't make... That sense, it makes sense because the, 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 the magic of, of the improvement is in the proof of this lemma. This, here you will lose, but lose less. So, okay, before explaining how these two lemmas uh, give the theorem, let me just ask, is the statement of, of lemma too clear? So how do these two lemmas give the theorem together? Well, you start with, uh, you look at the function maximum over all x of g lambda weakly self-avoiding walk of x divided by g random walk of x. Well, why, do I put, why am I putting these absolute values here? <laughs> these are positive numbers. Okay, you look at this function. This function as a function of lambda, you show that it's continuous up to lambda critical. This is, uh, I will not show that, this is, uh, but this is easy. This is, you know, you know, it's a, <laughs> lambda critical is a radius of convergence. Everything is analytic inside. You have to show something, but it's not difficult. The combinations of these two lemmas show that it cannot be between two and three. The minute it's smaller than three, it's actually smaller than two. Yes. Well, supremum. I'm not definitely not, uh, not claiming that, the, that it's achieved, so sorry. Uh, well, it is, but uh, yeah, for lambda smaller than lambda critical, it is achieved because this guy would start decaying exponentially and this guy doesn't, so, so it is actually at, achieved, but uh, let it be super. <laughs> uh, the combinations of lemma 2 and lemma 3 gives you a forbidden gap. Okay, it cannot be between two and three. Once it's smaller than three, it's smaller than two. That's just taking lemma one and then lemma two. On the other hand, it starts at uh, one, <laughs> right? Because at lambda equal to zero, everyone can calculate what's going on. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just equal to one. So it has to be smaller than two all the way to lambda critical. And then you just use dominated convergence. And you get an answer about, and you get a result. And let me not, not give any more details. I know, I know it's a, a little bit too quick, but that's not the most, but I think, but let me instead of giving more details about this bit of the proof, let me just say, you know, I, I'm sure some of you at least have heard that lace expansion is a kind of renormalization. It's like a rigorous, renormalization 
in the physical sense, and it doesn't seem this way from this dilemma. Where did the renormalization go? Where are the boxes that we like so much? And the answer is that renormalization hides in the process of taking lambda to lambda critical. Okay? The closer lambda is to lambda critical, in fact, what, what do you get? How does the picture look like? The closer lambda, you, you actually expose longer and longer paths. So moving, for example, from lambda critical minus epsilon to lambda critical minus epsilon half is, is a renormalization step. So, so the, the, it will just give, it will just allow longer path to appear, to make like a significant contribution to the green function. And so you, in fact, as you approach lambda critical, you expose bigger and longer and longer paths. And you can think, you, you could, well, it's not formulated like that, but you could think that maybe in a way you take here information from previous steps and pull it to the next step. So it's not, it, it will be hard to justify it given the proof, justify this heuristic given the proof, but, but at least on a, I guess I should press T2 now, right? No. But at least, roughly, this is the this is the point. Um, another point I want to make is about Fourier transform. It's really impossible to understand condition one, two, three without Fourier transform. <laughs> Let's understand why. Okay, maybe I'll take it a little bit down. Okay, what are we doing here? We are trying to uh, invert, a con uh, we are trying to do inverse convolution. Everyone knows how to do inverse convolution. You take Fourier transform, you take one over that, and you take inverse Fourier transform. Okay, let's see what these conditions mean for, especially two and three. What do conditions two and three mean in Fourier transform language? So. Condition two is just that delta hat at zero is bigger than zero. Condition three say that that delta, okay, that's, that was self-avoiding walk. So delta self-avoiding walk hat minus delta random walk. Sorry for not writing the lambdas and so on, hat is a very nice function at zero. This, mean, this means that it's twice differentiable with a small derivative. So it's twice differentiable, and its derivative at zero is smaller than constant times beta. Roughly, okay, not exactly. But at least this follows. This is a consequence of that. It, that it's not one-to-one, -one, but at least th this is a consequence of that. Okay, this is exactly what there is a minus three there. In fact, my, uh, the, I could prove this lemma with minus two minus epsilon for any positive epsilon that I want. Just about the second derivative. Now, this function, everyone knows what it looks like. It's just a cosine. <laughs> okay, so... Delta random walk hat is just, you know, sum cosine xi. Okay? So if you want the derivative, and all the action happens at zero. So if you claim that the derivative at zero is small, this means that if you take beta sufficiently small, then this will be, you know, smaller than one over 10, then your function near zero would be concentrated inside, you know, will be between two parabolas which never touch, so it will never touch zero. And this is very important because, of course, you cannot invert it if the Fourier transform touches zero significantly. One point is okay, but, you know, if it would touch zero, uh, for example, on, 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 a, on a curve or, or, a, or a D minus one, uh, sorry, a D minus one surface, definitely there would be no reasonable in, uh, inverse. Okay? So, 
So these conditions are very easy to understand when, once you Fourier transform the whole thing. But we cannot Fourier transform because we will not have Fourier transform what we, once we go to, uh, to, to arbitrary groups. But on the other hand, it turns out that it's not easy to do to Fourier transform it even in, in ZD. And this is, at least for me, it was a big disappointment that you, there's something here which doesn't allow to, to use Fourier transform. Previous proofs did use Fourier transform. Okay, there is a history here that I will maybe explain later. F but Fourier transform has some losses, which you know that, for example, if you assume that, okay, let's, let's, let me talk in one dimension, okay? If we have that Fourier transform uh, decays like, okay, in general dimension, no, no, like d, if Fourier transform, if your function is smaller than d2 minus k, then this means that its Fourier transform is k time differentiable, is, sorry, is k minus 1 time differentiable, and this means that f <laughs> is smaller than x to minus d minus k plus 1. Usually this plus 1 here, who, nobody cares about it, usually it doesn't matter. But this is eventually a renormalization scheme. You have to get out what you put in. Okay, everyone who did renormalization knows that, that you have to build your <laughs> assumptions so that if you, if you like to think about it inductively, then it's an induction, so you have to get out what you put in. You cannot avoid it. And then if you, if you use Fourier transform too liberally, you will get stuck with these plus, plus ones. And you cannot avoid that. The, 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 both these uh, conclusions have counterexamples that show that you cannot improve them. So... So, so, and for this reason, Fourier transform was not, and we will give a proof of lemma two that doesn't use Fourier transform. Now, how much do I have? Actually, do I really have two minutes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> um, what? Five, ten minutes. Okay, well, okay. Okay, so so I guess five, ten minutes, that's maybe enough to at least say something about the proof of lemma one. Usually, I, le proof of lemma one is classic. It hasn't changed since the pa original paper of Bridges and Spencer, so there's nothing new in what I'm going to say now, and it's actually explained very nice in the original paper. The original paper could be a challenge to read fully, but this particular bit is very nicely exp explained. So, and it's just an inclusion, an inclusion. Okay. So, proof of lemma one. Uh, let me do it as follows. Okay, so. Let me just denote this by UST. Well, UST is just a, this is just shorthand notation. Don't uh, don't worry about it. So that's minus beta times the indicator that gamma of s equal to gamma of t. So UST depends on beta and on gamma, but I will not put it in the notation. Let me just write it like this. Okay. And now if it's a product, let's open it. Everyone knows that, know that it's impossible to get uh, useful estimates that way, but let's do it nonetheless. <laughs> okay. Okay, now let's draw S as a collection of lines. So here is from zero to, well, the length of gamma. 
And let's just draw a, a, a nice little arc wherever there is, and let me represent S. S is a, let me draw it as a collection of lines. Okay, I, hope, I hope you understand what these lines stands for. And let's find the first point which doesn't have any arc going above it. Let's call that P. It stands for primitive, but okay, it's not important. P is the first point So it depends on S, of course, and on everything with no line above it. Okay. And now let's open everything up. Oh, I'll, I'll take my notes. So what is G lambda? It's, well, it's the sum lambda to the n, and then the sum over all gamma with length n, and then the sum over all s of this product. Okay, now, now the n equal to zero is special. Let's put it aside. This just gives you the indicator at zero. n equal to zero is not, uh, is not, is special and we want to put it aside. Now let's start rearranging the sum. First of all, I want to take, put the sum over s in the beginning, and I want to break it according to the position of p. So now I'll take sum over all p from 1 to n. Okay. And then let's, and then I take sum over all s n. And then I call S1 just the arcs here, and S2 the arcs here. So this is sum over S1, which are, uh, you know, there are couples. Okay, let me, let me explain that literally in a second, and then sum over all S2. And now we put the sum over the path. Yeah, okay, I should finish, but uh, I, I will finish uh, quite soon. Okay, so let's div divide the paths also according to which point we are at. So, gamma 1 would be the path that's up to P. And then gamma 2 would be the path that's N minus P. And finally, we have our lovely product. Now, what are, the what are the possible values for S1? S1 is, an, there is in this, once we've divided it according to the first point with no arcs around it, there is almost, there is no connection. S1 and S2 are now independent. That's the whole point. You can choose for S1 any value that you like, as long as it has, doesn't have any point with arcs around it itself. And for S2, you have completely, completely unrestricted configuration. There is no relation anymore. So, we rearrange the sum. Uh, well, I definitely need a bigger board for that. <laughs> so, and with this, I will probably finish for today. So what do we get?
you have a sum of all points, and then you have sum of uh, S1 and gamma 1, product of uh, st, uh, lambda to the p. I'm taking the lambda to the n and breaking it into a lambda to the p and lambda to the n minus p. Then you And then, and then, I'm taking this product. This product is over S1 union S2. I'm breaking it also into S1 and S2, putting each one aside. Okay, so now I'm taking just the product over S1. And then, wait, I forgot here something. Yeah, I forgot the sum over P. And then I have the sum over n minus p, which is also unrestricted. It could be any number from 0 to infinity. Right? Because p was an arbitrary number between 1 and n. n goes all the way to infinity, so n minus p is just an arbitrary number between 0 and infinity. Lambda to n minus p. Then I have sum over all s2, which were under okay, what is y? I forgot y. Why is just uh, y is just gamma of p? Sorry. So S2 is completely was completely unrestricted, it's still unrestricted. Gamma 2 is some path from y to x. And then you have product over all st in S2 of UST. And this is the green function. This guy is just the, the green function of weakly self-avoiding work at the same lambda from y to x. So this was the green function at x. So what did we get? And let me finish with that. We got that the green function is equal to delta zero plus sum over all y, this mysterious guy, a function of y, <laughs> times the green function of y minus x. So that's a convolution. That's what we wanted. Okay? So this guy is our Laplacian. Okay, basically I'm out of time, so, so I will only uh, uh, make some uh, short remarks and, and, and uh, we'll continue tomorrow. Um, what I wanted to show you in this calculation is that, first of all, how the, the definition of the process comes in. Because lemma 2, uh, it's still on the board, good. Lemma 2 is a completely generic lemma about uh, solution of uh, convolution equations. It works equally if the, conv for, uh, for if the convolution equations came from you know, percolation or, or outer space or whatever. So I wanted to show you how the definition of the process comes in. Now, what I didn't show you, maybe we'll show it next time, is how the dimension comes in. It comes in when you try to estimate it. Okay? The dimension comes in when we will in improving property three, which maybe I will do it uh, 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 tomorrow. Uh, and finally, I wanted to show you that the Laplacian is very unexplicit. It's not something that you can just hold. It doesn't have a formula. It's defined 
essentially, essentially it's an inclusion and inclu exclusion procedure, even though it's a bit hidden. But you know, once you've studied it enough, you, you, you can see that it's an inclusion exclusion procedure. So the Laplacian, it comes from, the Laplacian comes from taking the green function on which we don't know too much to start with and doing a complicated inclusion exclusion. So it's very inexplicit. And one, one last remark, and I really finish that, it's not negative outside the dam. It has negative and positive terms, which is why a lot of the properties of, uh, of the usual theory uh, for Laplacians will not be useful for us. And, and i sorry for taking way too much time. I think that's it for today. Yes. But could it be that this could be useful also for quantum random walks? Now, I really realize that there are many way, different ways in which you can define a quantum random walk. But could it be useful Wait, there? What? The, you mean random walks and groups? Yeah. Yeah, that's the basically due to Feynman, I think, even, uh, that you can represent quantum models using random walks on uh, permutation groups. So, and that's also what... Uh, uh, this, uh, and, uh, there are various ways to do that, you c if you know the work of Tot and Ulchi and uh, so on. So, uh, so yeah, that, that's what basically what I had in mind when I talked yeah. about quantum models, yes. Okay. Any questions? Uh, so where is non-commutative? It's for tomorrow? Or? Yeah, non-commutativity will, will come in, well, it just, for me, not putting here <laughs> e to i uh, <laughs> e to i anything. <laughs> That's where the non-commutative comes in. It comes in the, the in what I didn't write. So, <laughs> so, so normally, once when you do uh, well, in the in, for example, the original proof of Bridges and Spencer, when they did this whole expansion, they put the <coughs> They put the Fourier transform already into the formulas and got an expansion for the Fourier transform of delta. Okay? And I didn't do that. I got all estimates in, in, in uh, phase space because I would not be able to use Fourier transform for the generalization that interests me. And uh, strangely, it also gives a simpler proof for... Uh, well, okay, not having a term is better than having a term. I do, but that's not really the real reason. The real reason is that the, full, the conditions, these, if you look at equivalent conditions in, for example, uh, Harris Slade or Van der Hofstadt Harris Slade on other places, they are formulated in terms of the Fourier transform of delta and they are more cumbersome and less clear why there should be, why, that, why the, that's the correct set of, they, they stop after this. <laughs> I think that's the this major simplification here is that the, the interface between lemma one and lemma two is, is uh, more clearly defined and the conditions on delta are more natural. It's not, it's not a really great simplification, but, but it's a cleaner, this way. Okay, so thanks.